Well, welcome back again. We are just kind of moving right on from what we just did, and uh, it's good to see that you're interested. Uh, we're getting lots of comments down below. Thanks for those comments. We will be answering the best ones, those who are really serious, those who are not trolling us, those who are actually asking questions, and the good questions, I'm going to get Mel back probably next week, and we'll go ahead and make sure that we get these uh, answered, that we get them so you can follow through. Because one of the great things about what Mel and I are doing is that by putting this up on YouTube, we get peer-reviewed almost immediately. And in fact, it's, it's within minutes we get peer-reviewed. Uh, because of that, the, the peer review, that, that's the critique of what we're saying. That's what we mean by peers, like you, you are our peers. Uh, we're, that is actually helping us and making certainly helping Mel to then know where he needs to uh, funnel his energies, where he needs to also unpack material that he has yet to look at. And also the realization that because this is so new, and it is so new, I don't know of anybody besides Mel who's doing this, who has found this material, or who's actually bringing it out to the public. There are areas that he's missed, and that's why we need your help. And that's why it's so good that you're asking these kind of questions, so that it fine-tunes us, it fine-tunes Mel, and makes sure that he's on the right track. And also, the enormous amount of support we're getting from you all. Thank you so much. You you're really have done a real uh, blessing to us, because you are showing that Mel is on the right track, that he is finding the right material, and that he's also coming to the right conclusions. Mel, there you are. Thanks for coming aboard Hi. again. Great to be back. Yeah, it's, it's a good, good reaction to the last video. It's good to, to see all the comments. The comments are good and the questions are great. We're not going to answer them in this video because we still want to continue up. There's an awful lot more that Mel has to say about this issue of where the Quran comes from and the fact that it's about from much further north, up in Mesopotamia and the Euphrates Valley. So, uh, and the fact that he's now gone through the language basis for it, when you look at the words, when you look at the Aramaic, when you look and see these references, uh, not only in the Quran, but also from the traditions, Al-Buhari, volume 6, 509 and 510, showing that that argument that's going on there is not necessarily an argument about the Qureshi versus everything else. It's actually about Babylonian Arabic, Aramaic, and Mandaic Aramaic. It's actually a very real argument that's happening in a very real place in a very real time, which all makes sense. Uh, now we're going to go and look at the audience themselves. And this is the second half of the two-part series that we're doing on looking at whether or not it is Iraq that Islam began at, whether or not this man Muhammad actually lived in Iraq and not down in what we do today know as the Hijaz, known as Mecca Medina. And who are these Quraysh people? Who are they? Okay, Mel, I'm going to give it back over to you. You're going to bring up your uh, PowerPoint. And as he's doing that, just to let you know, this he's even actually increasing and actually changing it as he's been as he's been going back and looking at the questions. So this is very timely. Over to you, Mel. I can see you've got a map up there. Let's start with this map. Yeah, so I suppose one thing I would like to do is to just go back just momentarily to the second video where I looked at the historical Muhammad, which was E.S. Ibn Kabisa, and I used the evidence from Sevius that, that tells us where he was when he met a group of Jewish people, and he points out that he was in a place called Tashkistan, which is between the Tigris and the Euphrates. And uh, Sebius actually tells us that the Jews had left Edessa, which is way up in north, and they were heading home, which presumably would be Babylon, where the Jewish exilarch was. And between those two points, we have Mesopotamia. So this is very interesting because obviously this fits like a glove with all the other evidence that we're going to look at today. And I'm going to start by looking at the Aramaic um, that's in this region and uh, then move on again to the audience. So as we mentioned the last day, there was three different dialects of interest. There was Syro-Aramaic, which is in Syria, Babylonian Aramaic in Mesopotamia or Iraq. And then off to the east, we have Mandaic uh, Aramaic. These are distinct dialects. They have similarities between them, but there's also significant differences. And if you spoke one dialect, you could very easily be confused but with some of the words in the other dialect. There is also another dialect, which I haven't referred to yet, which is in uh, the Palestinian area, uh, which was Palestinian Aramaic. So that was more a Jewish form of Aramaic. So that's another one. It's not as important for, for our purposes, which is why I left it out. So going on from there then, the audience originally 
presumably could understand Aramaic and were familiar with Syriac literature, both Christian and, her and her heretical, because they got the allusions. The last day I mentioned about the fact that there's various Syriac stories referred to in the Quran, but they're not told, they're just alluded to. Another part of the audience was also familiar with a subject that was quite obscure, a mixture of Talmudic sources and various Jewish folklore. Again, they got the allusions. Now, just two things before going any further. Um, the audience that are reading the Quran or listening to the Quran are actually quite a sophisticated audience, even though there's lots of mistakes that we can point out in the Quran. This is kind of highbrow stuff to, to get all of these allusions. So we're talking about an intellectual um, audience who are familiar with Syriac literature. They don't need to be retold, it just pointed to. Talmudic stories and so on, and it's all weaved together nicely. That's, that's quite interesting. So bear that in mind. And the third part of the audience then were au fait with mandaic incantations and rituals, as I mentioned last day, as evidenced by the various calling on objects of nature, for example, on the mount, by the pen, and various other ones that we could point to. Yet, the authors seem to be distinct from these groups. It's like as if the authors of the Quran are in the middle of a group having a discussion with these three um, members of the audience, um, not exactly identifying with any one of them, but having similarities with some, agreeing with some aspects, disagreeing with other aspects. And it's like as if they're writing the minutes down of the debate afterwards. Now, it's interesting that the Quran itself identifies its audience as Jews, Christians, and Sabians. Now you can have a look there. I, I won't go through them, and I'm sure you're all familiar with those three groups. The Quran indicates that its audience are Jews, Christians, and Sabians. And you can take a look there at three different surah uh, passages. Um, surah 262, surah 569, and surah 2217. Now, let's start with the first group and think about, okay, we're looking for a Jewish audience uh, who are quite, quite a, a knowledgeable group who get the illusions, get the references. So let's look for the Jewish intelligentsia in Iraq. Where are they? So here's a map of Mesopotamia or Iraq. And as you can see, here are where the yeshivas are. Yeshivas being the Jewish academies. So you have Nisibis at the top there. You have Pumbadita. You have Nahardia, Mehosa, and Sura. So what is a yeshiva? It's a Jewish educational institution that focuses on the study of traditional religious texts, primarily the Talmud and the Torah and Halakha, Jewish law. The studying is usually done through daily si urim, or lectures or classes, as well as in study pairs called chevrutas, which is Aramaic for friendship or companionship. So that's interesting that they had this idea of a, like a master disciple um, process in the learning. Interestingly, we see the influence here on Islam that also places great weight on the companions of the prophet in Arabic, as sahaba. So that's quite an interesting detail as we move on. So let's look at the different places um, that are in Iraq, which were the, the Jewish centers of learning. Pompadita is in a location which is now Fallujah. And then there was another place called Sura. Pompadita had a yeshiva. It was founded by Judah Bar Ezekiel uh, in the year 2020 to 299. The Sura Academy was founded in 225 by Abba Arika. They were both highly influential for about 800 years, so well, in, well into the Islamic uh, time frame. At the time, so in other words, in the seventh century, the academies of Pompadita and Sura became the most influential and dominant yeshivas for the Jews, and all Torah decrees and other religious rulings were issued from these yeshivas to all the Jewish diaspora. In other words, the Jews living outside of Israel. Pompadita was key during the period in which the sources for the Quran were being gathered. 
after, uh, with the sealing of the Talmud by Ravina, the second surah, the era of Savoraim began 499 to 589, in which for most of that period, proper studying on a regular basis no longer took place in Surah, only in Pompadita. Now, Surah didn't cease to be a, a center of learning, it, but it became very much second place to Pompadita, which remained the key place of learning at that time. So that's going to be a key clue to where the audience is. Is it merely a coincidence that the chapters of the Quran, which were considered separate books at one time, are called surahs? That's an interesting coincidence. Perhaps there is a link there. I would throw that out as a suggestion. I also can mention Nahardia, one of the early centers of Babylonian Judaism. It was the seat of the Exilarch. It traced its origin back to King uh, Yehoiakim. Nahardia was destroyed in 259 AD and its place as seat of the second academy was taken by Pompadita. Towards the end of the fourth and at the beginning of the fifth century, Nahardia again became a center of Babylonian Judaism through this, sorry, though this was overshadowed by that of Surah. So essentially Pompadita was, was first, then Surah and then Nahardia. These were three very important places of learning for Jews. So, as we can see, Pompadita was the most important center for Jewish learning in the seventh century, century. So bear that in mind. We see that there on the map. Now, we see Pompadita and we see Sura, and we see Alhira, which is the Nestorian Christian center. It's actually the capital in, in a sense for the Nestorians. And then way off in the east there, you have the Mandane area, which some people believe to be identical to the Sabians, and there is scholarly dispute about that. Um, but certainly, if they were the same group, it certainly makes sense. Now, just looking at the map, and this occurred to me, when I was trying to think about the audience for the Quran, I looked at the surrounding audience. The obvious thing I thought of was, if you were to um, go to the center of all of that, say, for example, where you have Nahardia or Mahosa, that would be a logical place for the dialogue to take place in the Quran. And so that was my intuition. And so from there, I saw, okay, Mahosa is interesting. That's quite an interesting place. There's two cities there. Let's investigate that and see what we come, come up with to see, does that corroborate my intuition, which might be that that's where the Quran came from as we can see there, okay? So my, my, my intuition was the audience surrounds Mehosa. Okay, so let's look at some evidence from Surah 112, considering now that the Quran was written with a Jewish audience, Christian audience, and a, a, a Sabian audience. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, say he is Allah, the One, who is Allah, the Eternal, who was never born, nor ever gave birth, the one beyond compare. Now, what's interesting is the word that's used here for one is not an Arabic word. They have borrowed a word which is actually Hebrew. It's a Hebrew, Hebrew word, ahad, or achad in Hebrew. This surah demonstrates a willingness to use Pompadita style learning to use as a stick against Christian hera. It is entering the debate and saying on this issue, we side with the Jews over the Christians. It is also a polemic against the wording of the Nicene Creed. So as you can see there, if we were to compare the Nicene Creed with uh, line three, he is Allah, the eternal, um, you'll see that in the Nicene Creed, it begins with uh, God the Father, uh, God Almighty. I can't remember the exact words, but it, it refers to that. And then it moves on to talk about uh, Jesus, and it talks about Jesus being uh, begotten, not made. So here we can see in the Quran that it's using information from the Jews and using it to attack the Christians. And that's interesting. So this would suggest that the, the authors are interacting with the Jews and the Christians here. And this would make perfect sense if they are interacting with academics from the Jewish side. Okay.
No. Fascinating because this is what we have seen with the Dome of the Rock, which we talked about earlier in 690 to 691, where you have almost all the reference. Again, 112 is also on those inner ambulatories. Again, attacking Byzantine Christianity in this case, because you're there in Jerusalem, which is the seat not of power, political, but certainly of religious power for both Jews and Christians with the Church of the Sepulcher and also the, where the Dome of the Rock sits is where David's temple used to be. So it's fascinating that you see these, I mean, you're right. They, these are, if you look at the, if you unpack it from internally, you will see that these are discussions that are happening to a, in a certain place, but then you have to place to where that place is. And in this case, Pump, uh, Pumpadita looks like you've got it. Well done. Okay. So let's look at the alternatives. We have Mecca as a possibility. Did it happen in Mecca? Well, as we've discussed earlier, Mecca likely didn't exist even as a hamlet at that time. It certainly wouldn't have had a learned, a learned population in its vicinity in which Weti theology was discussed. So even if I grant to our Muslim audience that Mecca would have existed in some form or other in the seventh century, it is preposterous to suggest that there was um, Jewish academies um, in that vicinity. There simply wasn't, there is no evidence for that but there is certainly clear evidence that no, not only that there were Jewish academies uh, near Maho Mahosa, but actually it was the academy. It's the, the, the most important one in Judaism. Listen, now, I, can see at, the, I, I can see the comeback on this, and I, I know that Muslims will try to sh uh, shut okay. you down on this. And they'll say, listen, Mecca is where Abraham is, uh, went to in chapter 21. Uh, if you look at chapter 7 of the Quran, verse 24, uh, it is Mecca where Adam and Eve are then thrown down to out of the Garden of Eden. They'll come back to you with these. And for those Muslims who do that, look and see where whether Mecca is in any of those verses. When you look at chapter 21 with uh, verse 51 to 71 about Abraham, and it is not Mecca. Mecca is not there at all. It is the Kaaba. Well, Kaabas are in every major city. That's been well been proven now by Hitti and other scholars. And as far as chapter 7, verse 24, there is no reference to Mecca at all. It just says down to earth. Where do you get Mecca? You have to go to the ninth and 10th tradition to say that they were thrown down to Mecca. So again, throw that out because we've already thrown out their traditions. The only reference, as we said earlier, the only reference we can find for Mecca anywhere, the earliest reference is not till the continue out of Byzantia, which is written in 741. That is the 8th century. Again, much, much too late. Not the 7th century. So I would suggest that no Muslim can come back up to us and say, this is Mecca that this is referring to. This is where the audience is. The audience is not Mecca. Throw Mecca out of this equation. We're in the 7th yeah. century, Muslims. Again, we're not in the 9th and 10th century. We're in the 7th century. We're not even in the 8th century. We're in the 7th century. In the 7th century, there is no Mecca. It doesn't even appear on any maps until 900 AD, which is the 10th century. So just to shut that down, because I know that will come up. Okay, so we're going to put, if you like, a line through Mecca. It's, it's, I, I rule that out as a possibility. Petra, um, you know, it has certain things to go for it, but it was in decline. It had been a capital of the Nabataean kingdom 500 years before. In the 7th century, it seems it had no seats of learning and no significantly sized population of Jews and Christians that engaged in the type of dialogue we would expect to find in a more cosmopolitan location. In fact, the two Christian churches that I'm aware of in Petra are sort of out of the, the main center. They don't seem to be playing a significant role. It seems the pagans in Petra were the, the ones that were more significant at the time. Also, all Jewish theological questions typically were sent to Iraq for discussion and response. So, you know, may, I, may, I just interject, may I just interject yeah. something? I, I know you're going to talk about this in our question and answer period. Yeah, and that's yeah. what do you do with Petra versus what do you do with Iraq or Mahosa? I would yeah. suggest that we're looking at two, I, 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 you are right, there is a diminution. Remember, Petra would be the historic place for uh, the historic tombs and temples. It would be the historic sanctuary for the Nabataeans leading up until the 7th century. But remember, yeah. Once you start getting a political capital in Damascus, as we do know, this is where the this is where Muawiyah had his capital. This is the first time we see Arabs having a capital in a place like Damascus. Already, politically speaking, if that is the capital, then you got to ask what what happens to Petra. 
Petro was never was a political capital, but it loses its significance, as we're going to see as we go on. This whole civil war that was happening between the Arabs, the Arabs, and when when Abd al-Malik then come in, in, comes and introduces and puts the Dome of the Rock there in Jerusalem, Petra, no, though it's still significant for uh, Abd al-Malik in that he has his uh, both the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque that were then uh, created in 705 are facing Petra. That is true. But can you see what's happening to Petra? Petra is becoming less and less significant because you have these two great powers. The, and we haven't got into this, and this is not the time to necessarily bring it up, the Umayyads and the Abbasids, who are now vying for power. And that's going to come into your discussion because the Abbasids are, where are they located? Interestingly, the very same place we're talking about in these, in these three lectures. Yes, that's absolutely. in Iraq. That is that. So people pull back a little bit and start to look at the political powers that were vying for ascendancy, vying for for people's uh, control. Meanwhile, while that's all happening, it stands to reason that politically speaking, Petra is still important. But yeah. theologically speaking, theologically speaking, and this is what Mel's talking about. Theologically speaking, look and see where the learning centers were, and it looks like the learning centers were in Pembutita. Uh, Pembetita, or how do you pronounce it? In Surah, Pompadita, in yeah. Pompadita, Nehardia. And of course, all of that surrounding Mahosa, and of course, you have the Al Hira for the Nestorian Christians. All of this, that's where all of these discussions are happening. That's where the debates Absolutely. were happening. Absolutely. If the debates were happening there and the discussions were happening there, that would make sense and why the Quran is, built, is, is created there. And yeah. that would make sense, what you said in the last episode, why this argument about, this is a book written for, in Arabic, in Arabic, are you hearing me? Who are they talking to? <laughs> They're talking to someone who are having the discussion with. You can, only have a, you can only make an argument with another person. An argument takes two. So who, yeah, are, who, are, who is the audience that they're having this argument with? Take a look and see where the centers of learning were. Take a look and see where the centers, uh, centers of theological learning were. And it looks like they're all right here in the Mesopotamian area, which is, makes sense again because that is where historically everything takes place for all the great civilizations happen in that area. No wonder then that's why the Jewish have their greatest centers of learning. So do the Nestorian Christians have their greatest centers of learning. Possibly even the Mandeans or the Sabaeans also have their, their center of learning in that area. But much too far north and much too far east. Back to Absolutely. you again. Okay. So let's look at that Mehosa again. Now, Mehosa was the name in Aramaic for the cities of Seleucia on the west bank of the Tigris, and Tesiphon on the east bank of the river Tigris, okay? In Arabic, the name is al Medein, the cities. The singular uh, uh, for that is Medina, which is city. So we see the word Medina. Now, obviously, that's interesting, the word Medina. It's not massively significant. It's just the Arabic word for city. But it gets better than that, as in the Sasanian times, Tesiphon was called Medina al Attika, the old city, the emphasis on the old city. This is not any old city. It's rightly referred to as the old city, as it was the capital of both the Parthian and Sasanian empires. This is a hugely significant city much, much more significant, at least from the Persian point of view, than Petra was. Obviously, Petra is very important from the Arabic point of view or the Arabian point of view, where, but there is no city like uh, this old city, as it's called, Medina al Atika. This is the city for the Persians, so that is very significant. Okay, now, we mentioned in the very second video, I was going to say the first video, but the second video of our series, I spoke about my idea that uh, Muhammad was this guy mentioned uh, by uh, Sabius and who I identified with Ias Ibn Kabisa. Sabius says the following, just to remind ourselves of where he was located, just to see how it works out. So the Jews departed taking the road through the desert to Tashkestan, Arabia, to uh, the sons of Ishmael, the Jews called the Arabs to their aid and familiarized them with the relationship that they had through the books of the Old Testament. In that period, a certain one of them, 
a man of the sons of Ishmael named Muhammad, or actually I should say it correctly, Mahmed, became prominent. Mahmed taught them to recognize the God of Abraham. He ordered them all to assemble together and to unite in faith. Now, have a look. On the map is Edessa, which is up here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Uh, way down here is the seat of the Jews. Okay, way down here. Um, it's probably actually just north of Babylon, actually. Okay, so the Jews have been asked by the Byzantines, well, it's probably more ordered <laughs> to leave Edessa. They had, there had been a siege beforehand, and the agreement was that they open the gates and they, they head home, which is down here. Okay, so it tells us that on their way, they meet Muhammad and they have a discussion with him. Now, it's interesting that, that here is where we find old Medina. So, so far, all of the things that I'm saying so far all fit together like a glove. It all makes perfect sense. We don't get this uh, corroboration if we place it in, in Petra, and we certainly don't get this corroboration if we put it in Mecca. Mecca requires incredible um, backflips to make it fit. Here, it's straightforward. There are no holes in the narrative. It all makes sense. You bring it down to the Hejaz, then you have to say Sevius got it wrong. Right in the 660s, he got it wrong. That, to me, that doesn't make sense. Yes, he may have got some details wrong, but he uses this word Tashkistan, which appears to be a Persian name for Mesopotamia. So he's very specific. Did he get it wrong? It makes perfect sense if, if his starting point is Edessa, and he's saying that the Jews went home, that it stands to reason that he's correct in terms of the location. Okay, so that's, oops, I'll just show you. That's where Sabius is locating Muhammad, okay, in that seventh century source, where you find a place called Old Medina or the Old City. Now, another detail is the Battle of Dikar, which occurs in the Islamic traditions, is actually southeast of Old Medina, as you can see there. So Old Medina is, say, up here, just east of Najaf, and Dikar is down here. And as the bird flies, it's 135 miles, a little bit longer if you take a windy road, but there you have it. It's, you know, it makes sense. Um, however, if you take the old tradition, you have a lot of explaining why they're making these really long trips to various places. It, it makes perfect sense when you set it in Iraq. Okay. Now, um, a question that is often asked, what about the Islamic calendar? Surely that contradicts what I'm saying. According to the Islamic tradition, the story behind the Islamic calendar is that Muhammad was exiled from Mecca and he went to Medina. So surely then I'm wrong. I, I, you know, I've got something wrong here. It, that's what the Islamic tradition says. And is the Islamic tradition ever wrong? Doesn't that presuppose Muhammad was exiled out of Mecca and went to Medina? Because the calendar says so many years since this particular year or whatever. Um, it is possible that it relates to Muhammad being deposed from Hira because the historical person that I mentioned was deposed from Hira. So there's him getting kicked out of Hira and moving to this Medina, which is inside the Persian border. And as someone in the comment section pointed out, Muhammad was a Persian proxy. In other words, he was chosen to work for the Persians and he was made a king in that area. So that kind of makes sense for him to go back to the Persian side after it being deposed. So again, that makes sense. Or maybe this whole idea of being exiled from Mecca to Medina is just a foundation myth that somehow um, was an accretion that occurred over time as they started to turn it into a legend and romanticize the whole thing. Because very often people want to add details to places to make them more significant. The early inscriptions don't include um, AH with the year, but right in the year of the Arabs. Um, they most, li most likely this marks the year that the Arabs of the Ghassanids and the Lakhmids united to push off the yoke of the Persians, or more specifically the Sasanian house and the Byzantines. Again, Iraq is central to, the, to this. 
the Hejaz is outside the sphere of the action. Now, I spoke to, or well, actually, I had communication by email with a professor of Utah University, uh, Dr. Peter von Sivers, because it is his thesis that the reason for the idea of in the year of the Arabs was this unity between the Gasnets and the Lachmets. Um, and uh, I just, uh, I asked him for his source and he had a source from the seventh century. And uh, I, can't, I can't remember the exact, uh, uh, sorry, I can't remember the exact name of the source. I'll, I'll have to um, add that to the comment section later. But um, th the key idea was that he saw in the source that there were a Western group and an Eastern group and they united at this time. And so he identifies this as the beginning uh, for the Arabs, okay? So it wasn't about a mythical exile, but it was actually a unification amongst the Arabs and there was a leader, which we yeah, call I, Muhammad. This is, you know, when I had my discussion with uh, Robert Spencer, he brought this up as well. When I asked, why is the year 622 so important? And he says, this is the time when the Arabs really rose up against their, their oppressors. And that is why it's important historically why 622 then is, called, is now then chosen later on uh, as the year uh, of the Hijra, the, which is the Exodus. It looks like, no, the reason 622 is chosen is because, and you've mentioned this before, this is when the Arabs started to get their identity in the fact that they were now rising up against those who had so far been in power over them. And this is what you always do whenever you're being oppressed or whenever you are... Uh, you've been colonized and you rise up against that colony, then you, that becomes your independence day. So that's why we, we here in the United yeah. States, uh, are we have our independence on July 4th, okay, against the tyranny of British. I'm oh, sorry if you're being British, that's not, that, I shouldn't use <laughs> no, that. I'm Irish, so that doesn't matter. <laughs> but uh, that's why I love tea so much. And that's, um, <laughs> but the same thing you can say, uh, uh, and anytime you have, a, you have a specific date where then you, your identity comes to the fore, then you, you, everything, all the dates start with that date. And that's why AH then has been interpreted as, reinterpreted as in the later traditions as the time Muhammad moved up to Medina. No, it looks like this is when the Arabs came into their own. Yeah, this is the later invention and was projected back. I call this a retro version. You know, it's, it's taking um, an idea from a future time and pre pretending essentially that this happened in the seventh century. Yeah, we, so call I think redac this... we call that redaction. That's called redaction. And, re yeah. and what you're doing here is redaction criticism. And that's one of the things that you have to do when you look and see in almost everything we have been talking about when we, we the, one of the biggest problems we have with much of the later ninth and 10th century uh, traditions is they do this redaction all the time. And they do it so that Muhammad comes to the fore. So that's Muhammad's life that is, uh, uh, that, that takes that significance. When in reality, this didn't really have to do with one person named Muhammad. It had to do with a whole people of whom Muhammad was part of, as we're going to find later on. Okay, so I'm just going to move on. So what we're referring to here in terms of the year 622 is the Ghassanid kingdom there off in the west, which essentially is Syria, and the Lakhmid, which is essentially Iraq. There's there's a slight difference in terms of the terminology, in terms of the geographical location, but approximately that those two are that. Now, so if we just move on from there, we are going to look at a Chinese source, which I believe is very rarely referred to in any uh, look at uh, Islamic history. Um, so it's good, probably a good time to bring this one up. Um, it is from 801. So it's quite late, um, but there's reasons to suggest that this may stem from a much earlier source. To you, funny name, or from an English point of view perhaps, to you, presented his encyclopedic writing, uh, Tong Tian, to the throne. So obviously a very important source. He had begun it in 768, which is approximately around the same time as Ibn Ishaq. Um, so it is late, but as you can see, it's Chinese source, so it's independent. So it can't be accused of being biased. It's well outside of the area. Some parts he took from other sources, so potentially could be much earlier. Please note that Mesopotamia is called Tashkistan by Sebius, as we saw, which might explain why the Chinese refer to the Arabs as Tashi. 
The term may relate to the Taiye or Tai tribe. I'm not entirely certain, but there's certainly a similarity there. Um, on a section in this massive tome on the Arabs, he reveals the following. And I just note that I'm getting this from Robert Hoyland, uh, seeing Islam as others see it. So you can look this up yourself if you want to see the full uh, excerpt. Now, the key details that he reveals is the following, that Muhammad was a king. So that's a confirmation. He was a Persian, which is going to be a bit of a bombshell for some of you, and that he belonged to the Thai tribe. So he says, during the Yong Hu reign period, 650 to 56 of the great Chang, the Arabs Tashi sent an embassy to the court to present tribute. It is said that their country is West or Persia. Some also say that in the beginning, there was a Persian who supposedly had the help of a spirit in obtaining edged weapons with which he killed people. Subsequently, calling for all the Persians to become his followers, there were 11 Persians who came and according to their rank as Mushu, which I would suggest is a Chinese attempt to say the word Muslim or the equivalent of Muslim, were transformed into kings. So he's suggesting that it started with this Persian who was the leader. And then there was a series of other persons who became uh, leaders or kings after that. After this, the masses gradually gave their allegiance and subsequently Persia was extinguished and Byzantium was crushed as were uh, also Indian cities. The Arabs were everywhere invincible. Their soldiers numbered 420,000 and by this time their state was 34 years old when the original king had died. His office passed to the first Moshu and now the king was the third Moshu. The royal surname is Tashi. So this might suggest that uh, if, if we think back to uh, our guy in northern Iraq that we mentioned, uh, Iyas, we mentioned that he is from the Thai tribe, that would fit with this Chinese source. So I find this interesting. Now the source that he's using is probably from well before Ibn Ishaq. It certainly wasn't from after the time of Ibn Ishaq because we can imagine that Ibn Ishaq would have um, overruled any later traditions. So it's likely that this source that he used and, and essentially dropped into his encyclopedia was from an earlier period. Um, I would suggest it probably came from sometime in the seventh century. So what we're seeing here from an independent source is a very different story to the Islamic tradition. We are seeing Muhammad as an outsider. Uh, we are seeing him as a Persian particularly and who belongs to the Thai tribe. And it's interesting, in the Quran, it talks about um, the person, I can't remember the exact surah and a verse, but it talks about someone having a foreign tongue. I don't know, Jay, if you remember that verse. This is, no, someone, there, um, this is someone of a foreign tongue. There's, there's an accusation in the Quran. Now, the word for foreign in, uh, in the Quran is an Aramaic word, ajami, which means foreign, but it also means Persian. So there is an accusation in the Quran, it's, it's, it's peculiar, that says this person has a Persian tongue. It's actually Surah 16, Ayah 103 that you're referring to. Let me just read it. I've got the Quran here in front of me. And, and indeed, we know that they, and it's uh, in parentheses, they, they're talking about the polytheists, the pagans, those who are not believers, say, it is only a human being who teaches him. The tongue of the man they refer to is a foreign well, this is a clear Arabic tongue. Okay, so a reinterpre reinterpretation of that is that the word is ajami, which in, uh, is a Persian word, sorry, is a, an Aramaic word, which means either foreign or Persian. So what the Quran is referring to is someone is teaching the author, but he's not uh, Arabian, he's Persian. So that's, you know, that adds to our case that there is a strong Persian angle to the Quran, which locates it again as here on the borderlines between Iraq and Persia. 
Okay, so let's move on from there. Another interesting detail is that Ali was governor of Al Hira in Iraq, just as Iyas was before him. It's a very important city, the capital for the Nestorian Christians. Now, again, Iraq remained central under Al Hajjaj, its governor from 694 to 715 AD, under Abdul Al Malik and Al Walid. He also can, ruled can, Eastern. Can we go back to that previous slide? Yeah. On Ali, you're you're bringing in then the whole. I mean, you're 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 actually you're actually supporting the whole Sunni Shia divide by saying oh, this. Yeah. Are yeah. you? Do you realize that? So you're actually saying now this now makes sense why there is a Sunni Shia divide uh, with the son of Muhammad of Muhammad or who Muhammad or whatever the name you or Ilyas, uh, his son uh, lives in Al Hira. In, well, no, not just. Not necessarily his son, but certainly a, a possibly a descendant or a successor of him. Okay. So it could be in, in the traditions, he is the son, but in this case, or yeah. the adopted son. But in what you're yeah. saying is, in fact, that may be reason reason why he's the adopted son, not the uh, biological son. <laughs> in the later traditions, they had to do that yeah. for uh, so that they would not give ascendancy to his uh, blood blood relation. And it yeah. looks like this is where the controversy is. If he is a governor of uh, of Hira in Iraq. Uh, as Ias was before him, then it stands to reason the Sunnis say, no, he is not the direct descendants, whereas the Shiites say, no, he has to be the direct descendants. And so they've introduced that into the story later on. Fascinating, yeah. because you're bringing it up and saying this all now is situated in Persia, not yeah. down in the Hejaz. Yeah. Okay. So again, Iraq remains central under Al Hajjaj, its governor, 694 to 715 AD under Abdul al-Malik and al-Walid. He also ruled the Eastern territories. Um, so you can see al-Hajjaj is obviously very important as we'll see in a moment. So, so if we think about all the significant details in relation to al-Hajjaj and the, the origin of Islam. So we have uh, Hag, which is the Hebrew for festival and the equivalent of that in Arabic is Hajj. The Jewish festivals of Boots, Hag, Hash Sukkot, or Sukkot even, Hash Sukkot, involved a circumambulation seven times on the seventh day, which sounds remarkably familiar. The circular is called the Hagag, or in Arabic, the, or I'll say it fully, Al Hajjaj. So it's interesting that according to the Hebrew, the person who does the circumambulation is referred to as the Hagag, which in Arabic is the Al Hajjaj. So that's interesting. We know that Al Hajjaj is said to have gathered the Quran. Um, he is said to have introduced the use of the Quran in mosques, and uh, Robert Spencer mentions that. He is said to have introduced the diacritical marks as well. The earliest verifiable reference to the Hajj is in the first decade of the 8th century when Al Hajjaj was governor. So, again and again, we see a lot of uh, corroboration. The circumstantial and artifactual evidence would suggest that he was the one that started this pilgrimage practice. This is a separate issue from the Qibla. We're talking about a specific type of Hajj somewhere off in the West. The location for the Hajj could have been either Jerusalem or Petra. Now, so just as some evidence, this is the earliest Hajj rock inscription. As you can see, it's from 701 to 702 CE. It's right smack in the middle of Al Hajjaj's reign. The location is 350 kilometers southwest of the current Iraqi border. And as you can see, it's from Ha'il, Arabia. Now, there is also parchment evidence, um, and it involves a son-in-law of Abdul al-Malik in Egypt, writing to one of his governors in Egypt, saying, essentially, are you coming with me to the Hajj? Doesn't say where exactly. So that's two independent sources of evidence, again, that points to the early uh, 8th century um, in terms of the beginning of the Hajj. But, you know, 
maybe there maybe there's going to be evidence discovered somewhere that might point to to it in the seventh century but as it stands it looks like it started in the eighth century can i stop you there a minute oh. and go back to the previous slide yeah. again yeah one before that um, let, let me make sure that i'm hearing you correct hamel uh, you you're focusing in on the hudge but i'm focusing in on those two other references you said that he is the one that's responsible for gathering the Quran and then introducing the Quran into mosques and introduces the diacritical marks. Are, are, is that what you're saying here? That he is the one yes. that's well, if that's well, at the least case, it, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to say, well, you know, that is also in the tradition. Also in the tradition, apparently, uh, Abu Bakr does the same and um, Uthman. But it, it's possible that the first person to do it may have been Al Hajjaj, and then it was redacted twice back. Maybe they, they put it further back in time in order to make it more authoritative and to um, avoid accusations that it was simply invented during the time of Al Hajjaj. So all of these references to Hajjaj is the one who is the, uh, gathers a Quran, introduced the mosque, put it as a diacritical mark, and also the first verified reference to the Hajj. These are all from the traditions. Um, the well, the, the first reference to the Hajj being uh, from the early part of the eighth century is actually is outside the tradition. This is actually the earliest proof that we have of the Hajj. Which okay, is so strike off the, the thing about gathering the Quran, introducing the mosque, and diacritical marks. I would say strike that out. That's not that significant because that's nothing. That's nothing more than than. Or if you want to say this, what I would say, Mel, in this case is, isn't it interesting? that it is actually Al-Hajjaj who actually, even in the traditions, supports the notion that he changes it 11 times. Why yeah. would that be important unless, of course, this actually did happen, maybe he was one that actually introduced it to traditions and say, no, 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 this happened actually earlier with Abu Bakr and Uthman. And then they have to admit the fact that Al-Hajjaj actually introduces it because if he's the one that introduces it into mosque, that's hugely significant because he is, that's where the where are the first mosques that he would introduce it? Well, his mosques. Where does he live? Well, look and see where he lives. He doesn't live in the Hijaz. He lives way up there, and he's well known as being the governor of Kufa. Kufa is just southwest of what is today Baghdad. Again, in, uh, in as, or as we, we know as Mehoza, as you're introducing in this talk. Well, well actually, um, Kufa is the uh, replacement city for Hira. So when, when Hira got destroyed, in mysterious circumstances, it's, uh, I haven't really got to this, it's, it's, it's part of my future research, is to find out exactly what happened to the city. But from what I, what I learned, the, the city somehow got destroyed and they used the, the building material from that city to, to, to build Kufa next door. Well, um, that's, and that's hugely significant for the 8th century because it is Kufa that is that there are, th I mean, when we're getting into the Kira'at Qurans, you do know when we get into the Kira'at Qurans that of the 10 readings, the 10 major readings, of the 10 major readings, you have two in Mecca, one in Damascus, and all the other are in Kufa, which is three, seven of the 10 are from Kufa. I'm sorry, yeah. six of the 10 are from Kufa because there's, there's actually three in Mecca and Medina and one in Damascus. Hugely yeah. important for the 8th century. So it looks like if everything is surrounding the 8th century, even when you look at the earliest Qurans that we do have, I mean, this is for a whole other video that we can do just yeah. on where was the Quran put together. Suddenly now, it's now making sense why the major part of these Qurans are coming out of Kufa. The Hafs Quran comes out of Kufa. And that's yeah. why when you look at then the narrators or the transmitters of the 20 transmitters, of, uh, of them, 12 of them are from Kufa, just from that one city. So the majority yeah. of all the Qurans, because you look 12 plus six, you're getting to 18 of the 30 are from Kufa, just one city, where they should yeah. be from Mecca and Medina, at least me from Mecca and Medina, the others from Damascus, but Basra and Kufa, sorry, I shouldn't say just Kufa, Basra and Kufa, but from Iraq, this place that we're talking about today. So that's it's hugely significant by the time you get into the eighth century fascinating because you're now moving right into what we're on uh, the biggest co conversation that's happening right now on the internet and that is the Kirat problems so this yeah. is to me this is exciting because you're bringing up that Hal Hajjaj may be the one that actually introduced this idea of putting together a book a car and it's fascinating that you're saying that this got this was probably introduced at this period 
uh, in 705 or early 8th century by him, which then makes sense of another 30 years later before the first Quran actually comes into existence that we can look at today. And that is the, uh, the, the Quran of uh, Ibn Amir. Yeah. Well, fascinating though, his is from Damascus. The second one would be Ibn Kathir from Mecca. And then the third one would be Asim's from Kufa. And then they all start to proliferate after that. Yeah, at least according to the tradition. But what I would point out, you know, if we think back to the last video, we spoke about the idea that perhaps they, they turned material that was in Aramaic into Arabic. In other words, they Arabized it. Now, in order to do that, you have to change it in a, in a location where people had some idea of what they were reading. So it would sort of necessitate doing that work somewhere where Aramaic was still spoken. So we get back to the idea again that, you know, it all fits together very well. And that, um, so can you then understand why there are, <laughs> I mean, this is just, I mean, you can just start steamrolling with this because then you understand then why you have different Qurans that have completely different uh, diacritical look, uh, marks. That's what the kid are all about. And why you then have 10 different readings and no one complaining about it. Yeah. But notice when those 10 were chosen, they weren't chosen until 936, the 10th century. By that time, there would be all kinds of training centers and locations, but almost every one of them are in what is now today, Iraq, not down in the Hijaz. Very few of them are from the Hijaz. Yeah. So yeah. all the more supporting what you're saying. Yeah, this, the, um, the Aramaic script as well, when you look at it in, in terms of its rasm form, you can actually read it um, very much as if it were Arabic. So it's very easy to imagine that perhaps, you know, if we were to look at the earliest Qurans in what we think is Arabic, what you could be looking at is Aramaic. Um, and so if that's the case, then you, you have, when you apply the, the dots to that text, um, you could be talking about a completely different meaning or a significantly different meaning to the original text. Well, this is but, what your uh, friend Murad brings up because he does, he does speak and he reads Aramaic. And so he says this very thing, doesn't he? He refers yeah. to this all the time. And he talks about this fact that when you go back to that map again, when you look at yeah. that, sure. when you look at, see what the Arabic is, and this is what Al-Jalad has been saying. Al-Jalad saying that the Arabic that we see in the Quran, even in the Quran that we have today, it is not Central Arabia. It is actually much further north. In this case, it would be Aramaic. The Tar Marbuta, yeah. these kind of things, that they don't exist yeah. in the, the Arabic that would have they, they, they've been there in the Hijaz area. Fascinating. I mean, this is for another talk, this is for another video. Yeah. There's, something, there's something else I want to point out as well, is that the Nabataean script, which, you know, was, is key here, it was developed in Hira and then continued in Kufa. Okay? So yeah. essentially, when we, when we talk about taking a text which is in Aramaic and then Arabizing it and, and putting it into an Arabic script and so on, it all makes sense as being connected with Hira and Kufa. So I actually, I would suggest that, you know, the story of, of the Quran um, having been first written in Mecca, and I can't remember the other location you mentioned, but I think that's uh, another redaction. I think really the work was done in Kufa. But uh, yeah. It looks like yeah. everything has been done in the Kufa. And that's one reason yeah. why Muslims have not been able to explain why so many of the 30, 20, what we're talking about, 22 of the 30, Qurans that are now the official Qurans, the Kidah Quran today, are come from Iraq. Yeah, yeah. Why? If it if the whole premise was to have them from Quraysh. Okay, back to you. Okay, so a little bit more on Hira and Kufa. Hira capitulated in 633, and a new city was built nearby called Kufa in 636. Tradition holds that the Arabic script was developed there. The Kufic script ought really to be called the Hira Kufi script. And uh, this is actually um, a building that was found. I think that is a building from a monastery. Um, so there's not much left of it. But um, it seems it was destroyed in quite a ferocious manner. Um, I'd love to know more about the, the, the manner in which this all happened. But as I say, I, I don't want to go beyond on what we see. Uh, here's another picture of that area. And uh, a lot of it has emerged as the sand blew off. So luckily it's kind of coming into view now. It was hidden for centuries. Um, and there's an, another nice piece. Um, as you can see there, it's a, an image of a church from Hira. And so it's clear that Hira was a Christian city, an Nestorian city. 
And also another detail, is the cave of Hera, is that story an echo of historical origins in the Lakhmid capital of Hera? So that's another uh, aspect of the story that pops up and kind of makes you think, hmm, there's something funny about that. Um, so Kufic is the oldest calligraphic form of the various Arabic, Arabic scripts. It consists of a modified form of the old Nabataean script. The name of the script derives from Kufa, a city in southern Iraq, which was considered an intellectual center within the early Islamic period. Kufic is defined as a highly angular form of the Arabic alphabet, originally used in early copies of the Quran, and there's Kufa there on the map. Um, I want to show you an image of it there so you can see what it looks like. Here I use the Nabataean Arabic script. After Hira's demise, Kufa took over as an intellectual center. Again, Hira, uh, Hira and Kufa were intellectual centers, which again fits in with Pompadita as well. Originally, Kufic did not have what is known as a differentiated constant, which means, for example, that the letters TB and TH, uh, Ta, Ba and Tha, were not distinguished by diacritical marks and looked the same, which leaves us uh, with lots of possibilities of uh, misinterpreting the text. Oh, this is fascinating. I mean, what you're bringing up here, this could, this could be an entire study in and of itself. Because we've always known that you have the Ma'il script, which is this, this perpendicular, slightly slanted, Ma'il means slanted in Arabic, to the right. And that you find in the, the 2165 manuscript that you have in the Bibli uh, Bibliotech, I'm sorry, the British Library, uh, there in the Riblak Gallery. You also then have the Kufic scripts, which you're, looking, which you're pointing out there, the elongated, much more, uh, much more angular and much more stylistic. And we've always assumed that they coexisted simultaneously, but when you look, when you look and just visually, when you look at the, uh, the, 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 the early, well, let, let's just call it the, the Ma'il, the early, it looks, it looks much cruder, which suggests it is much earlier. When you look at the Kufic, look how stylized that is. It's much more beautiful. It looks like it comes from a place of learning. So what we could be saying, and this is why we're going to have to redo, if, you, if the archaeological evidence and the historical evidence suggest that this is all coming out of Kufa, which makes sense now, that's the word Kufic, then you're going to have to understand that this would all have come out during the Abbasid period. The Abbasids were the ones that introduced this script. The Abbasids don't come into power until 740s, 749. That doesn't say that they that they had you have to have the political power for these manuscripts to start to be produced, but that would also suggest to me that the Kufic comes after the Ma'il. The Ma'il would be the earlier, cruder script, which would be for and that's would be and we're going to have to now start putting that onto a timeline. But that's for another time, another date. I what I love what you're doing here because you're actually st you're not only using the language, you're not only using the audience, but now you're going into the script itself, and that's how you d d define. That's how you date manuscripts, by looking at the script. And what you're suggesting to me here is that this is a later script that was introduced in the 8th century, not in the 7th century. It would have not made sense in the 7th century because of the fact, as we've already said, the Arabic, Arabic was the wrong type of Arabic there in the Hijaz. But in the 8th century, when you then starting, when all these uh, centers of learning, like in places, like you're saying, in Kufa, uh, and these other Jewish places, uh, Pampadita and uh, Sura and Nehardia, all surrounding Mehoza, that would make sense that th 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 this is where that script then came into its own. This is where that script was introduced, which then suggests to me that we're going to have to redate a lot of our manuscripts. Love it. Yeah, lots of implications. And a lot of implications, because you're going in lots of different areas here, Mel. You're pulling up an awful lot of material, but it all fits to a piece. And this is what you would expect to happen when you are looking historically. You're trying to stick to the 7th century, and you're trying to stick to the 8th century. You've got to see what's in your, in your hands. What are you looking at? And what I'm looking at here is a much later script then, from what you're telling me. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, well, just one more thing. Go back there just so people don't come back. <laughs> okay. I'm going to throw one. Yeah. If people say, well, yes, but look at the dots are there. Um, yes, those dots are there. But look, you notice they're in a different color, which could be suggest they're putting that a later date. When there were yeah. dire critical marks, that would suggest, yeah. and if you look, you can see where the, where the, uh, where the, the circles, um, there, there's a 
pyramid of circles there, that is the end of a verse. That yeah. obviously is put in a later date because it doesn't accommodate yeah. it. It's, so that's, that's yeah. the end of the verse. That is a later rendition as well. I, sh I should point out as well that this is just an example of, of the Kufic script. It's not necessarily the earliest one that's, that exists, it's just one example. So it could represent a much later one. Okay, so let's look at halves that you mentioned a few minutes ago. There's his name, and at the end of a very long name, which I won't repeat, but you can see he, he's uh, got Al Kufi there. It says that he was born in 706 and died 790, okay, so uh, the 8th century. Born in Baghdad, so again, Iraq. His name suggests a link with Kufa, Al Kufi. According to tradition, he moved all the way to Mecca in the Hejaz, where he picked up the Kufa recital method from his father in law. Asim ibn Abi al Najud. This name would suggest he came from Najaf, as you can see on the map, which is right next to Kufa. The only way this makes sense is if Kufa is Mecca, because it seems silly if he had a father in law that he would go from uh, where he was all the way down to the Hijaz to meet a father in law, which you'd, you'd imagine his father in law probably lived nearby. And, you know, if you just look at it logically, it makes more sense for him to simply go to, from uh, Baghdad to say uh, the Najaf area um, and learn from his father-in-law there rather than going all the way to the Hijaz. It seems like a redaction is going on. Um, and it's interesting that 95% of Muslims read the Hafs Quran, i.e. a Quranic recitation of an Iraqi student from an Iraqi narrator. In other words, 95% of Muslims read an Iraqi Quran. <laughs> you know? just, to be, just to be fair, uh, that was only chosen <laughs> in 1924. And it was because yeah, the Ottomans true. loved it. The Ottomans yeah. were the one that chose it. I'm, I'm, yeah. Just in case people do want to come back on you. But yeah, that's I, the irony. That's one of yeah, the, ironies. the irony. And we've, yeah. we've brought that up think, many times. When yeah. it was finally think, chosen uh, uh, in 1985 by King, uh, King Fahd. Why in the world did King Fahd, whoever was uh, giving him his, his material, why did they not understand that you're choosing an Iraqi script for the, all the world when you have th th at least four others that you could have chosen that were from the Hijaz that would have actually supported the Qureshi dialect, proving that they didn't understand that any more than many of the Muslims today. Yeah. I think uh, one explanation I've heard is that they chose the script that was the, the simplest for the printers of the time. And That's so exactly it might why be they just, chose it. You're talking about now, you're talking about the Ottomans. Ottomans, yeah, the Ottoman period. So that's that's probably the reason. It's just a coincidence, but it's a coincidence that just reminds us of the Iraqi thesis again. Um, so you can't make too much of it, but it, but if we, if we um, just look at the fact that even... Well, you can make up shit and then it began there and it ends there. <laughs> you can say that yeah, much. Yeah. That's what even begins... Also ends, even though they've uh, they've tried to hide it, it's it's come back to haunt them. That I would put it that way. So, um, so on in terms of the final thoughts, then um, the Iraqi thesis helps join the dots on a lot of holes in the Islamic narrative that never made sense, such as why the caliphs didn't rule from Mecca, but instead uh, way up north in Hira, Ali supposedly, and Damascus. It recognizes there were some Qiblas that point towards Petra, but prior to the 690s, the religious buildings were not Islamic mosques, but a precursor, such as Abraham's places of worship uh, directed towards Petra, maybe because it was the burial site of uh, Harun. And what is most important is where we could likely find an audience competent enough to get the obscure allusions to Syriac and Talmudic stories. Mahosa, Old Medina, verifiably fits that requirement. So essentially, if we look at the abundance of evidence, and this is a small part of an even greater amount of evidence, um, I think it's fair to say that there are massive holes in the Islamic tradition, and there seems to be um, an effort to hide um, what really went on in the um, early days. Now, so I'm just gonna unshare there. Well, while he's me. bringing it back to the two of us, I, 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 let's just wrap this all up and bring it into a conclusion. I've taken notes as you've been going along like I usually do. I wanna just,
from a from a person who's hearing from the outside, this is what I picked up from what you've said. Uh, jump in at any time to correct me like you did in the earlier video. I think that's good that you do that. But this is what I'm hearing you say, Mel. And I think this is important that you are saying what you do because you're actually saying not only is the language, as we said in the earlier video, not only is the language from the Iraqi area, the audience is from the Iraqi area. And this is where you're pointing to. Look at the audience. And when you look at the audience, you can see uh, that there are these cities, uh, these cities of, of uh, the Jewish cities of Pumbetira, uh, Sura, Nehardia. Look and see, then you have Ehira, which is the Christian Nestorian city. These four cities were, are all places of learning. And much, almost much of the words, as we said in the earlier uh, episode, the words, 70% of the words, the foreign words that are in the Quran are from uh, Aramaic, sorry, not Aramaic. Aramaic. And the center of the Aramaic uh, language is this part of Iraq exactly where this is going on but it's fascinating because you have the jews have their center of learning therefore the whole area that's where their center of learning are there is is, is there in pumbatita fascinating because that's just around what is today baghdad very close to what is today baghdad It'd be earlier was stefan and mahoza and then you say that um you look at surah 112 and you notice that Surah 112 is very clear. That's the same Surah that is introduced on the Dome of the Rock. Why is that such a significant Surah? Because it's attacking those they're having a discussion with. And it looks like the discussions they're having are with the Jews and the Christians. If that is the case, then it stands to reason that they're attacking the person of Jesus Christ, his begottenness, and also his divinity, which is in chapter 112. You talk about Medina, the city of Medina, which is main city, you're right. But then you look at Medina al-Atika, uh, al which means the old city. The old Medina, the old city, which is the Persian name, which is fascinating because that, that, that suggests that maybe that's the Medina that the later traditions are getting confused with. And if he, the whole exile going, as we know, the Hijra, Hijra means the exodus from one place to another. The exodus has always been uh, in the traditions, the later traditions is always from Mecca to Medina. It looks like what you're saying is it's not from Mecca as in Saudi Arabia, it could from Al Hira to Medina. Al-Hira, which would be the previous, because that is where the center of power was. That was the center of theology for the Nestorian Christians. And now they're moving away from the Christians, attacking the Christians, and moving back now to the Medina, the old Medina, where is now the, the central part of where the Muslims are now coming into their own. I do want Talk. to bring something. I ahead. do want yeah. to bring something in, actually, with something I forgot to mention, and it's actually very significant. Um, there are a number of other words in Mandaic which are very significant that uh, I want to tell people about. Isa is how it's a Mandaic spelling of the word. It's how it's pronounced in Mandaic Aramaic. It's Isho in other forms of Aramaic. It's uniquely how it's pronounced and spelt in Mandaic Aramaic. So that's significant. Yaya or uh, yeah, 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 I've got it said it right the first one. Yeah, yeah, is also the Mandaic form of John, Johan. So those are significant wor words there. Um, so now just, just remind people that's Mandaic extra support. is, Mandaic is, is, is what it, part? Yeah, so Mandaic is actually from the Persian side. So, so it's, it's just over, it's, it's the eastern part, it's literally over the river in the Tigris area. Um, so it's not, it's not far. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's inside the border uh, where Mahosa is, which is old Medina. So we find that's like the intersection between two dialects. So you have the Babylonian dialect meeting the Mandaic dialect. And so you can see why it's using a bit of both there. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that the only place that we can find the word Isa in terms of a dialect is Mandaic. So it's much easier to suppose that the Quran was written there, then way down the Hijaz, that doesn't have this explanation for the particular wow, is, spelling of it. Fascinating. So this I thought cool. I'd end with that bombshell. I think it's significant, you know? Wow, that is a bombshell. I mean, that's, I'm gonna to have to now change my, my uh, lectures if this is the case, because we've been asking, where is Isa come from? Because the word for, in the Arabic today is Yeshua, which is like Yeshua yeah. from Hebrew. Why is it Isa's in the Quran? If that is the case, if it's Mandaic Aramaic, then that places it right there right around Mendoza again, right yeah. around Med the old Medina, right around Stesiphon, right around Baghdad, right in the middle of Iraq. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, you. Another bombshell, as we're going to be seeing. <laughs> yeah. So 
<laughs> the exile goes back to that, also the year of the Arabs. And that's just what's just fascinating. You're looking at the year that, that today we call it after Hijra. But this is actually pointing to when the Ghassanids and the Lakhmids come together and push out the Persians and the Byzantines. That's why that year is always a big one. Because when did that happen? 622, as we saw in an earlier episode that we have. They push them out and they throw out the yoke from that. That's why from there on out, that becomes the year of the Arab identity. They now have their identity. They now no longer are colonized and they're taking, they're throwing out the oppressors. Fascinating, you brought in this whole thing from China. I love that. So you're not just looking at what's <laughs> happening there on the ground. You're saying even as far away as China, back in the eighth century, yes, it's in the eighth century, but Actually, it would ninth, not- Well, ninth century, beginning of the ninth century. Yeah, just to be- Sorry, I thought it was 768. Oh yeah, from 768 to, well, if I'm being to say the final date would be 801, finished in 801, so yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. okay, one year into the 9th century, Let's, yeah, but, yeah. But, but more than likely this is written in the 8th century, Let's, whatever it is, yeah. mostly, from 768 yeah. up to, 80, to 801. Yeah. This is a Chinese, and again, it's so far away, no one would have had it, it is completely, ex, uh, ex, and I love what you said, it is not dependent, no one could have had control over this writing, from that far, thousands of miles away. So here is an independent, completely independent source that's referring to these people as Persians. And that they are, they are the Moshu, which you think are maybe is their way of calling these people Muslims. That's their derivation. Is that what you're saying, I'm assuming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly what word that they were hearing in, in terms of Persian. I suppose that the linguists um, listening will probably provide some evidence on that. Well, score, as we desecrate the Arabic today, and as you tried to do yeah. so in your reading, so they would yeah. have desecrated it even more. Yeah. Because that is symptomatic. Whenever someone tries to take a word they hear, they put it into how they hear it in their own language. Yeah. But yeah. you're interesting because they do talk about Muhammad as a king, as a Persian, and from the place of Ta'i, which yeah. could be a derivation of the Tachkasatstan, which is Mesopotamia yeah. again. Again, placing yeah. him in. So even the Chinese place him in the right place. Get him and up there. And they say he in. was. And and they say it, it happened west of Persia as well, very significantly, not not south of Persia, not south yeah. west of That's Persia, right. not south. That's you know? right. So it's a nowhere south of Persia. This is west of Persia. Uh, you talk about Ali. He that he could be the, that he could have been the descendant or in some way related to uh, Muhammad, but they're both from Al Hira. Uh, Iyas is who you're referring to, and then you go into. Uh, Al-Hajjaj, and you say that Al-Hajjaj, who is the governor of Kufa, uh, so what we've been told uh, under the ruling of Abdul Malik, but he was way over Kufa. Look where Kufa is. Kufa is Iraq. And look at the significance of this man, Al-Hajjaj. He is the one that starts the pilgrimage. Well, pilgrimage to where? Well, then that's where you're going to have to get into some of Dan Gibson's material because he does say that he has these Watsat mosques, the in-between mosque. And if you take a look and you see now, Dan Gibson and you are going to have to have a discussion as to how you how you interpret these these different kiblas. But go ahead. I do, I do, I do want to say something about uh, about that, just even though it's quite brief. So if you think about the three groups, the Jewish group, uh, the Christian group, um, well, let's say, no, actually, we'll focus on the Abrahamist group, which are the, the main writers, I would suggest, of the of the Quran, the Abrahamist group the Christian group, and then you have the Mandaic group, which we might refer to as the Salians. So the, the Nestorians, being Christians, pray to the East. That would be their Qibla, essentially. You have these Abrahamists would be, have prayed to the West. And then you have the Salians, they pray to the South. So in terms of the tussle, where they're praying towards suggests who's in charge. Now, it's interesting, once the Abbasids take power, where you find the Mandate group who pray to the south, suddenly Mecca gets moved way down south. So I'm just suggesting that this may be a possible explanation for why they moved things way down south to fit with the Mandate point of view, which is they, they were used to praying south. They're the ones who prayed five times a day. And uh, there's lots of other similarities between them and uh, the later Islam. So I'll just throw that in. Throw that in. I think this suggestion. is something, this is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put a big question mark on this because I, I do like yeah. what Dan has done, Dan Gibson has done with this. I, and, and he looked, for me right now, his view of why you have a Mecca from Petra down, moved down to mid, uh, to the Mecca, present day Mecca. If you look at all the five stages of the, uh, of the Hajj, 
that you do see there, they can all be, re they are all reproduced in Petra. But that's for another yeah. time, that's for another debate. Again, yeah. this is a white paper, we're putting it out there and we're saying both are possibilities, Let we can, yeah. that this will continue and we may, may need to have both you and Dan on board to actually talk to each other and just put your theories back and forth and let the, the general audience come to their conclusions. But that's what we're doing, isn't it? You all come to your conclusions. Are you now seeing what Mel has done here? And this, this is, I hope you're picking this up. Mel is supporting both linguistically from the Arabic itself, moving from the Aramaic to the Arabic. He's also looking at it from the, as far as the physical evidence that's on the ground. He's looking at it from the historical view of where the big centers of learning are coming from. He's even using references that are words that are also definitions of words that come that uh, that c could only be Persian or could only be uh, Iraqi. And then he's also even using uh, evidences that come as far away as China to support the fact that the, all of this material, these people are not from the Hejaz, they're from much further north and they're from much further east. And they are all from the area of Iraq, which should not surprise us, as Mel said, because everything we've known about the great civilizations is from that area of the world. This is the seat, this is the cradle of all the great civilizations. If that is the case, then why are we surprised that not only the Jews are centered there, so are the Sabaeans, so are the or, or Mandaics, so are uh, the Christians, Nestorians especially, they're all centered in that area. And that's where the dialogue is going on. And with that debate going on between them, it stands to reason why the Quran keeps on talking about the fact that they always refers to the Jews and the Christians. And then it also says, why is it that this book, this book is an Arabic book? Why is it an Arabic book? Because there's a discussion going on as to whether or not it is an Arabic book and whether there are other languages that are influencing it. Great stuff, Mel. I mean, this is starting to get our juices going. It's getting our... <laughs> Are, are not only our brain cells functioning again, but I'm sure there's going to be a huge discussion about this. We want you to discuss. Put your ideas out there. If you don't like what Mel has been saying, say so. If you do like what Mel's been saying, say so. But come back th uh, and peer review us so that we can then get together. And we'll probably do it next week, Mel. You and I will get together and we'll actually a answer some of these questions. But we yeah. need you to put them out there. Send this out to other people because we are actually, we're revising the whole history of Islam in one fell swoop. And we're saying we're sick and tired of all the traditions that are from the 9th and 10th century that are kept on imposing and only giving us one narrative. And that's the only narrative that has been taught in all our schools and all our uh, seminaries and all of our uh, seats of education here in the West and also around the Muslim world. We're sick and tired of it because they're in the wrong people, the wrong place, much, much too late and at the wrong time. And we also, as historians, have asked, where then is the evidence on the ground? What Mel has done in these series of, of videos, this is the third one we put up th this week, these series of videos, what Mel has done is what every historian should be doing. Why they haven't done it to now, I don't know, but he's going back to the time period when this all took place. He's going back to the seventh century. We're only interested on in the seventh century. He's gone back to the languages. He's gone back to the names. He's gone back to the cities. He's gone back to the set, set centers of training, all from the seventh century. He's gone back to quotation after quotation, even looking at artifacts, even looking at the script of the Arabic. And he's saying in every case, it, they all point to one place, and that place is where it's surprise of surprise of where it should be. It should be Iraq. So you start out with Iraq. It looks like we end with Iraq. It looks like, as you're going to say in later time, it is where civilization began, is it not? If, if that's where the Garden of Eden began, it's in Iraq. If it's where the civilization began, then why are we surprised it's also where Islam began? But how did it begin and why did it begin? It began because of these discussions that were going on in the Abrahamic fold, these discussions that were happening between the Jews and the Christians and these Arabs or these Persians as who, who then wanted to have ascendancy. So can you see why this is important at this time, now in the 21st century, we're starting to connect the dots. And what Mel has done a great favor, thanks a lot, Mel. God bless you for all the work you do. God bless you for your humility. And God bless you for the fact that you really are striking a nerve here. Uh, keep it up. We want to hear more. And as you can see from the many comments, people are excited. We're going off the records as far as the number of people who are hitting this and are watching it and are also uh, responding to it. So over to you, Mel. You have the last word. Well, thank you, Jay, for having me on again. Um, as I say, this is a thesis or, you know, I've gathered up evidence from different sources. And this is how I interpret it. And, and others may question it and they may say, well, I disagree with this point or that point. But I challenge people to refute me. Um, tell me, tell me if you think I'm right or if I'm wrong, and uh, tell me why. Tell me why 
we should trust the Islamic tradition and why we shouldn't trust the historical evidence. So uh, I'd like to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> I was fascinating. I got a, a email from Robert Spencer last week. And then he said, Jay, I want to, could you please call me? So I called him up and he said, Robert Spencer says, I'm going to have to rewrite my book. I'm going to have to rewrite Did Muhammad Exist? And uh, my editors are agree with me. So he is now in the process of rewriting Did Muhammad Exist from 2012. He's going to have 10 years later, a completely really? new book. And he's going to introduce some of your material. And he's going to put wow. that and says, we've got to redirect. We've got to under re understand. We've got to start going back to the seventh century and look at it anew. Wow. So you're, you're getting a lot of people on board with you, Mel. Oh, that's they're, amazing. They're not necessarily agreeing with you. I'm not saying they're all agreeing with you. No, no. Okay. No. But at least that's what good. they're saying is you're putting up, you're bringing up, you're bringing into this whole discussion, a whole new category that we've not thought of before. And I think from years yeah. to come, people are going to look back and say, Mel, you opened up a real mail storm. You opened up maybe yeah. Pandora's box, but what a box. And this is yeah. terrific well, because it's getting us back to the truth. What I would like to say to the Muslims who are watching is I don't want you to just accept what I'm saying. I want you to think because you've been told one story. Don't trust me. Go and look up the sources. Go and look at the evidence that I've suggested. Work it out for yourself. Think for yourself. Don't trust the people around you. Trust your own instincts, trust your own eyes, your own ears. Look at the evidence for yourself. You may come to a different conclusion, that's fine. But at least think and see what happens because it's more important to find the truth than to live your life according to a myth or a legend. It's more important to find the truth. Um, and actually it doesn't matter how, how it turns out because at the end of the day, at least you know you found what is true and not something that's false. You know, that's important. Mel, thank you so much. We're going to call you and we're going to say you're the Iraqi man. We're going to call Gibson the Jordanian man. So the Jordan against Iraq, which is it? Where did Islam begin? Jordan, Iraq. What's noticeable, it did not begin in Mecca. So yeah. God bless you. It's been good to have you on board. We'll see more of you. Back to you again. And this is Jay then and Mel over and out. <laughs>